is, let's see, I think your fifth lecture um, for your base camp series, which I'm titling Sweet Salty and Everything in Between. So we're gonna talk about some electrolyte pearls today um, and see how that goes. Let's see. So our objectives today, um, we're gonna recognize and treat hyperkalemia and hypokalemia. We're gonna make sure you have your approach to acid-based disorders that's systematic and remind you how to do that again. Uh, make sure everyone leaves with a basic approach to hyperglycemia and insulin adjustment in patient. And then we are going to talk about managing hypernatremia and having a, an approach to hyponatremia. So disclaimer for today, this is a refresher. Obviously, almost any of these could be a full hour lecture in and of themselves. So I want you to work with your residents and attendings over the next three years to understand the nuances, and then even beyond that as you continue your career. We're gonna start off by hopefully in the last week, you have all seen a basic metabolic panel, but as a reminder, here are the things you're gonna to need to be able to recognize today. So the first thing I wanna do is to find out which of the following is most intimidating to all of you. Um, if it's potassium disorders, acid base, hyperglycemia, hyponatremia, I want you to, to type in the chat which scares you the most, and then we're gonna start there, and we're gonna do a little bit of a choose your own adventure um, type of lecture today. So if we don't get to something that you guys feel super comfortable doing, then that's great, but we wanna make sure we spend a little bit of time on the things that you're most concerned about. So type in the chat what you're most scared about, and then we'll kind of go from there. So we've got, okay, lots of acid base, lots of hyponatremia. It's kind of what I figured. All right, good. So let's start with um, acid base, then we'll do the hyponatremia and then we'll see where we get to from there. So we're gonna go to acid base and I'm gonna have you um, start by looking at this case. So we've got a 25 year old male. He has a history of alcohol abuse. He was admitted for four, day, for four days of nausea and vomiting and poor PO intake. His labs in the emergency department were notable for a light base of 3000 a lactate of 10, and the BMP that you see here. And so I'll circle some of the things that might be helpful for this. And then you astutely also have an ABG ordered. And I've also highlighted here what those stand for in case you've forgotten, something that you'll probably wanna to commit to memory. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out by just challenging you all to rack your memory and look back to med school and think about um, this acid-base disorder as a group. So I'm gonna break you guys out into breakout groups and I want you to use the approach that's here. So number one, figure out if it's an acid or base. Number two, figure out if it's metabolic or respiratory. Number three, you're gonna figure out if it's gap or non-gap. Four. You're gonna decide if you have appropriate compensation. And then five, look to see if there's in another underlying metabolic process. And um, what I would probably have you do, because when we break you out to the breakout group, you're not gonna have the, um, the labs here in front of you. So if you need to write anything down before you join that great breakout group, just have someone jot that down. So I'm gonna go up here and get you guys in a few groups. Looks like we have 32 people. So, um, or 32 participants. So we're gonna break you out into four rooms because I think some of these guys are chiefs and attendings. So I'll send you to your room. Um, I'm gonna give you about five minutes to work through this as a group. And then we're gonna go through each step together. And hopefully that'll get you your approach to acid base again. So here we go. All right, so everyone should be back now. Um, hopefully, this actually isn't as complicated as you might have thought it was going to be. So the goal here isn't to show you how hard it is, but we're gonna go through each piece. So I'm gonna ask um, group or breakout group one, can someone from that group tell us if you thought it was an acid or a base disorder? Is there anyone from that room?
And you can just unmute yourself and tell us what you thought. Um, we don't know if we were in group one or not. Yeah, <laughs> we might have been. We have Perfect. So you can answer anyway. That's fine. <laughs> we think we might have been. Um, we, we said that it was uh, acid disorder. <laughs> Good. And how did you decide that? Uh, the, the pH is 7.2. Good. What's your cutoff? Uh, I mean, more. Yeah, the normal is like around 7.35, 7.4, depending on, I guess, what. Great. So it's not 100% perfect. I'm going to cut off at this point, but that's, that's true. So we've got a pH of 7.2. We've got acidemia. Um, this is an acid disorder, not a base disorder. Okay. Um, if someone remembers if they were in breakout room two, um, how did you, did you figure out if it was metabolic or respiratory? Um, we said it was metabolic because the, since the pH is decreased and the bicarb is down and they both match, then it would be metabolic. Good. So let's go through that. Perfect. So when we're looking, if, you're, if you had a, um, a respiratory acidosis, your, P, your CO2 should be greater than 40. But in our case, it's 40 um, on, your B, or on your ABG. And then if we had the metabolic acidosis, our bicarb should be less than 24. So you're right that... Um, in looking at this, our serum bicarb was less than 24, so we've got a metabolic process going on. And then if anyone has questions as we go through this, please just uh, unmute yourselves and, and chime in. All right, so whoever was in breakout group three, did you figure out it's a gap or non-gap gap metabolic acidosis? I'm hearing from the VA over chat that it looks like they think that it was a gap. We thought it was both. You thought it was both. How did you think it was, or at this step, why did you think it was both? Because I did a delta delta and it showed to be both. Okay, so we'll get to the delta delta. At this point, you just want to look for that anion gap. So somebody said gap. So yes, you did have a gap. Um, let's calculate, look at that. So we had a positive anion gap. So we're taking our sodium minus our chloride minus our bicarb on all on the BMP and it's 22. So what's your normal gap? What do you guys know? Got someone in the chat. It says 12, good. Yep, so normal gap is 12. So we do have a positive anion gap here. Okay, so our next step following this approach is to figure out if there's appropriate compensation. Um, someone from breakout group four, um, did you find that you had appropriate compensation or inappropriate compensation? And how did you get to that? So, I think when we run the numbers for this through Winter's formula, we end up with an expected PCO2 of 30, um, 32 to 37 or something along those lines, 33 to 37. Um, and the PCO2 that we got on the ABG is 40. So I would assume that is not adequate compensation. Good. So good. So you did your Winter's formula. Um, and we get this range of 33 to 37. So definitely you guys got that, that correct. Um, and so then we take our, go look up at our ABG. We see that it was 40, as you mentioned. And so we don't, it's not, it's not compensated appropriately. We have a concomitant to respiratory acidosis on top of this. So our PCO2 is 40. We're holding on to a little bit of extra bicarb. It's not super far off, but it's uh, definitely not fully compensated. So we have that going for us as well. So at this point, we know we have a metabolic or a metabolic acidosis that's a gap metabolic acidosis and a respiratory acidosis as well. And so our last step, I think is the most complicated step in the part that really confuses people the most. Um, and this is where we're looking to see if there's an underlying, another underlying metabolic process. And so we need to figure out um, how to do that. Um, is there anyone, I don't know if I had a fifth breakout group, but somebody mm -hmm. wanna speak up about whether, what they found as far as whether or not there's an, another underlying metabolic process. Mm 
maybe those who mentioned that they thought there were multiple processes going on initially. Yeah, so I was always taught with the Delta Delta, like you just practice off of what it should be. So the bicarb should be 24, it's 18, that's six. And the anion gap should be 12, 22 minus 12, that's 10. So six over 10, and that is 0.6, which if I remember correctly, means there's something else going on, but I could be completely wrong. Okay. Um, no, I think that you're going to, going through that process right and thinking about, is there something else that we aren't accounting for? And there's like, you can think about the delta-delta ratio, the delta gap. There's a number of different ways to actually uh, approach this. And I think that the delta ratio to me is actually the very most confusing way to do it. And so um, we'll start here looking at this. So you mentioned that your normal bicarb is 24, and then we know that our normal anion gap is 12. So we're trying to figure out what our expected bicarb is. And so in this case, our expected bicarb is 14. And our bicarb, when we look at our, um, our BMP is 18. And so when we're looking at this, um, if the BMP bicarb is lower than expected, then you have an overlying non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. But our BMP bicarb, it was 18. So we actually have a simple anion gap metabolic acidosis. Now there's another way you can do this. Um, you can do, without even having the bicarb, you can do the sodium minus the, um, minus the chloride minus 36, which is the sum of the anion gap and the normal bicarb. And if you do that, um, that's kind of what your delta gap is as well, just not using the bicarb. And it's actually pretty easy, easier, I think, to, to remember. And in this case, again, you're only getting a simple non a simple anion gap metabolic acidosis. So we don't have a secondary process when we look at those numbers. Um, I think that this is where you can get really confused. And, and one thing to do is when you're going through this step-by-step -step is to make sure to do this at the very end um, so that you make sure you're looking at all the other pieces before you get to this final underlying metabolic process. Um, I think Doug astutely mentioned that. Um, just make sure you wait to do that until the end. Um, and then if you don't even have a metabolic process, then you don't have to do that part. And so I think that that's, um, if you can use this more simple method, you're not gonna get like the one, the point one, the point two, um, which actually gets quite confusing when you're trying to interpret it all. So in this case, we ended up having a, an anion gap metabolic acidosis with an overlying respiratory acidosis and no additional underlying metabolic process. Okay, so that's kind of the, the approach that we wanna make sure you take because if you do you know, one through five, um, you'll hopefully get through it without getting confused and it's actually not as complicated as it can be. Hey Mira. Yep. Before you go on, if you could ask the, the, there were several groups that were pretty confident that it was a mixed process. So if we could get their rationale and how they came up with their numbers, because it might help to understand because this is a really complex topic. Yeah, I think, uh, was it Dominic that mentioned that? Can you tell us your numbers one more time? It was actually Mark who, he actually just stepped out. He had a page, he came up with the numbers. I think he realized after you showed the, how we actually did the correction that he was wrong there, so. He missed the step on the bicarb. Okay. But it is really confusing. I think that that last step is the most confusing. And so finding the most simple way to look at it um, is potentially going to help you get through that step and um, be able to, to, to figure out what's going on. Um, you know, I think the, the ratios get really confusing because there are so many different levels when you actually try to interpret those ratios. If you think about it in general about is there something else that we're not accounting for? And then using the normals to help you do that, then you're gonna find yourself in a better place. Quick add-in, I think the reason that that got switched is because um, if you put your bicarb on top instead of your anion gap on top for a ratio, that's where the 0.6 comes from. Otherwise it's 1.6 and that would be consistent with a simple metabolic acidosis. 
Perfect. Yeah, Alex, that's great. And I, I was actually looking for exactly that because that's a that's probably the most common mistake I see get made, um, and it, it entirely changes your answer. And so I had a feeling that might be the case where the 0.6 came from. So yeah, it's always great to remember that the the delta anion gap goes on top of the delta pi pi. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Okay, so you'll remember some of you have probably heard of mud piles. Others maybe heard of gold mark. These are some of the ways to remember what causes an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Um, and in this case, for this patient, um, they had a lactic acidosis. So that's what was happening in our case today. But kind of keeping these in mind as you hit the wards of all the different things that can happen. Um, one that we learned about as we we're preparing this talk was iron, which was super interesting. If you have an iron overdose, um, you can get this uh, anion gut metabolic acidosis. And the thought is um, that it's due to some of the things that happen in the gut. Very interesting. Um, not a perfect answer, but um, kind of a fun one to, to learn about that you probably never see. <laughs> okay, so we got through that. The next one I heard people were worried about is the sodium disorders. So we'll move on to that. Let's see here. Good, so Sneha's answering that, those questions to help you um, remember how to do that last step in case you need to go back and look at that. So kind of moving on to sodium. All right, so our goal today is again, kind of trying to keep this simple. Remember that this can be a whole talk in and of itself, but it is one of the scarier things to have come up. Um, so looking at, you probably all have the, the orange book, the purple book, um, which has this table in it. And when we're looking at disorders of sodium, um, the, I think one of the biggest branching points is to figure out if someone's hypervolemic, you can figure that out and you can address that. And then the other two, you have to kind of think a little bit harder about what's going on. So in general, if somebody comes in and has hypervolemic hyponatremia, our goal there is we have to remove volume to help fix this. If someone comes in with uvolemic hyponatremia, and most commonly you're gonna see um, a form of SIADH, we've got to fluid restrict those patients. And then if someone comes in with hypovolemic hyponatremia, we want to treat the underlying cause, but we also have to use uh, fluid status to help us, um, help us fix these issues. So these are kind of our different branching points. And we're gonna go through um, a little bit here how to think about them. Um, a lot of times you'll get, you know, early on in your training, you're gonna to wanna to get all the different electrolytes right off the bat when someone comes in with hyponatremia. And as you learn the nuances, you'll actually be able to say, hey, maybe I don't need all those to start out. Um, but again, that's gonna come with more training. So um, you may start off by wanting all those, all those numbers. So acute hyponatremia, these are kind of the ranges that you'll see. A mild hyponatremia is about 130 to 135, moderate 129 to 120 to 129, and then severe is less than 120 or any sodium level um, that has, that's pretty symptomatic. So what we're gonna do today is imagine that you're on cross cover and your day team has asked you to follow up on a sodium level from earlier in the day. The patient came in at 3 p.m. They had a sodium level of 123 and now it's 9 p.m. And the patient received about a liter of normal saline when they came in on admission. So we're gonna do another breakout room here. And I want you to think about now. So what would you do if the sodium level was now one, 117, two, 126, or three, 133? And what other information would you need or want at this point before you make a decision on how you're gonna manage that? So we're gonna go back into our breakout rooms. I'm gonna give you about five minutes again, and then we'll come back and see what your thoughts are on how you're gonna address this. So again, um, just because you won't be able to see this when you get to your breakout room, the patient's sodium level was 123 when they came in at 3 p.m. and it's now nine. So you have a six hour time difference. And you're now looking at what happens if it went down, uh, went up to 126. Or... Okay, so we should have everyone back now. Um, does someone from breakout room three wanna tell me what you're thinking about Number one, if the sodium level dropped from 123 to 117, what are you thinking?
if someone wants to examine the patient, good. So I know VA TMA is not the only person there. Does anyone have a mic that can talk from uh, breakout room one? Talked about uh, that it was most likely SIADH and that we'd like to fluid restrict. Okay, okay. Yep, and so VAA room also said to either fluid restrict or give hypertonic. Okay, so we're looking at a pretty big drop here. We're down below 120, but maybe we just gave them the wrong thing when they came in because we misinterpreted this. Um, any other thoughts on what things you would want to know to be able to appropriately interpret this? Good, Anita wants to get some urine studies. So if we haven't gotten urine studies already, it's probably a good time to do that. So sometimes when patients come in and we think we know what's going on, we don't necessarily have to get all the studies yet, but maybe she, maybe it's time to get some, some more studies. Um, do you think that this person is appropriate to stay on the floor? Do you want to move them? What are your thoughts there? You're going to be doing like Q, probably one hour sodium checks and the nurses on the floor probably aren't going to be happy with you. Um, so I think they probably have to either go to a step up unit or ICU, but just okay. from a management perspective from a nursing. Okay. So I see a couple other people also saying a similar thing to maybe go to the ICU for more frequent checks. Um, you know, there's not a, um, sometimes they'll have you go down, you know, they'll make them go to the um, ICU or step down unit if it's less than 120 because you're looking at severe hyponatremia at that point. So a lot of times it's more the regulations of the floor that's going to determine if this person goes to the ICU. Um, but I think that you're right that um, this person probably needs a little bit more um, frequent observation than um, what we can do on the floor. So that's a good time to get your seniors involved. Um, and if you haven't already, so that you can determine the best next step for them. Okay, good. And then who um, from breakout number team one wants to talk about the second instance? So um, what would you do here if your sodium is now 126? Does anyone remember being in breakout room two? There were like 10 of you guys. <laughs> How about breakout room three? You got it, Mira. You got it? Uh, so since it's been um, a correction of three in under 24 hours, that's within our acceptable range. And we think that it's, it's reasonable. Good. Good, so this person is actually correcting almost perfectly. So we'll go through that again in a minute, but um, right. excellent. So this person's gone up by three in the last um, in the last six hours. So they're kind of on track with that. You know, you don't wanna correct more than 0.5 per hour. And so things are going well at this point. And you can either um, continue to kind of watch their trend at this point, because they haven't gone up super high and they're kind of on track. Um, and I probably would, would, um, hedge toward doing that than just turning everything off completely. But yeah, you'll, you'll still be wanting to watch them overnight, um, for that day team so that when they come back, it hasn't gone, um, up by too much more. Um, but you're right. You're on the right track. So how about number three? Um, how about breakout room four? What did you guys think about number three for a sodium of 133? Anyone have any thoughts? Okay, looks like someone in the chat might have had a thought. Good. So everyone's a little bit worried about overcorrection here, and they're thinking about giving some um, some water. So they want to give D5, um, and I think that that is also appropriate. So it looks like we already have corrected this person by about ten points, um, which we'll talk about in a second is a little too quick for these patients. And so you do want to think about doing um, some D5. Other things that are helpful to know about at this point is what's the chronicity of this person's hyponatremia. Um, that helps you know how worried you need to be. 
But again, um, you're thinking along all the right lines about giving some D5, stopping any additional um, normal saline at this point. Okay, does that make sense to people? And then, yeah, so plus or minus DDAVP, um, usually we'd start with D5 at this person. If it's um, less, if it's more acute and less chronic, then we would think about it more likely, um, but usually you wouldn't be doing that by yourself at night um, without some direction from a senior resident or uh, the renal team. Okay, great. So we'll talk quickly about how quickly you can correct. So the general rule is four to six milliequivalents per liter in 24 hours. So that last one, we're going too fast. Um, we don't wanna get more than eight in 24 hours or 0.5 milliequivalents per hour. And um, if severe symptoms, so if the patient has like seizures or in a coma, all these things, um, you wanna do four to six milliequivalents in six hours, and then you wanna maintain that level for the remainder of the 24 hour period. And those people are typically um, in the ICU. So that's um, where you're gonna be seeing those patients. And the thing that we get worried about is um, this osmotic demyelination, which we wanna to try to prevent. Um, and so if you go too quickly, people can have this happen. Most cases that we actually see this happen in, um, you're correcting uh, more than 10 to 12 in 24 hours. The highest risk people are people that come in with really low sodium, so like 105 or less, um, if they have hypokalemia, alcoholism, uh, malnutrition, liver disease, those are people that we often see this in more so, but um, we wanna make, be careful to avoid it because that can be pretty devastating. And then these are the, just briefly discussing the patients that end up in the ICU for severe hyponatremia with sodiums less than 120. Um, again, these are people that are going to be in the unit. Renal is usually involved in helping direct their care. Um, those are the patients that you want to give hypertonic saline to. You can do these um, 100 cc boluses up to three times. You can give it as a drip if someone's chronically hyponatremic, less than 120. And you're going to need more frequent BNP checks in the unit. And then these are also the patients that you're going to consider desmopressin for more likely because what can happen is if you start to correct their hyponatremia, they can overcorrect too quickly. And so sometimes we'll do the desmopressin as we're doing the hypertonic saline to try to prevent from that having that severe overcorrection. Okay, now we have another case here. You're in the ICU and your 52-year-old female patient who initially presented with septic shock has been intubated for four days and continues to fever. You notice on her BMP while pre-rounding that her sodium trend over the last three days has been this, so 146 to 149 to 152. How might you guys explain this trend and what might you do even before you round um, for this patient? And I'm just gonna have, um, let's see, the VAs don't have mics. So can someone from Denver Health chime in and just tell us what you're thinking with this case? We're not gonna do a breakout room for this one. Okay. We said uh, discontinue the saline because her sodium's getting close to like the osmoles of normal saline. Okay, so this patient does not actually have uh, continuous fluids on right now. How does that change your thinking? Gotcha. It's a free water loss just due to the fact that she has not received fluids. Yeah, did you hear that? No, I didn't hear that. Yeah, um, I was just going to say it's a free water loss because the patient hasn't been receiving fluids. It's been losing to like insensible losses and evaporation and probably like fever as well. Great, good. Okay, good. So this is um, this is hypernatremia. So I'm not trying to trick you and think that this is hyponatremia. Um, and this is just somebody that has over the last, you know, over the past few days, they have been on a vent, they've been fevering, they haven't been able to drink water. Um, and so we just need to address that. And so with hypernatremia, um, almost always, the patient's losing free water. 
there are some other instances, but um, I think what I want you to remember, remember today is this free water loss. And then the treatment. So if they're also hypovolemic for other reasons, you wanna make sure you volume, volume replete that first with um, lactate ringers or normal saline. But if not, you wanna give them free water. So you're giving them D5W or you're encouraging PO intake if they're able to take that in. In this case, the person is on the vent, so they can't do that. And then how to figure out how much, who has an approach to that? Anyone know how to calculate it? Let's see. How about our Denver Health crew that already popped in? You guys know? We turn to MD Calc. Great, MD Calc. Okay, so good. We're gonna do this before we even go on rounds because this is something that's a little bit um, less high intensity. We're gonna put in all her information. So she's female, she's an adult. Here's her weight, um, here's her sodium now. And the one that thing that I want you to make sure if you do this is to look at the sodium desired because you don't wanna put, um, sometimes that'll automatically put in a number and just make sure that you're not putting a number in that's like uh, you know, 15 points lower than the sodium that's in there because um, otherwise you're gonna end up overcorrecting them. And your goal correction right here is you don't want to, you don't really want to go down more than 10 milliequivalents per liter per day. Um, but that's essentially you'll figure out your free water deficit. Um, you'll order that to be given over several hours and then you'll check it again. So pretty, not the most complicated thing to manage, but good to recognize. All right. So um, I think because the the consensus was that hypo and hyperkalemia was the third most scary thing, we're gonna do that next and probably end there. Mira, can I add just a yep. thought on hyponatremia? Um, it's one of the harder things for interns to manage because it requires you to have a lot of fortitude in what you know needs to be done. Uh, you're not going to want to call renal at three in the morning. No one's going to want to draw Q2 hour labs for you. They're going to ask if they can just add them onto the next set, which is only four hours later. There's a lot of um, management that goes on here. And I think this is your time as interns to really shine and to actually take take ownership of that patient and say, look, this is what the patient needs in a very polite way, very collegial way, you know, but knowing that this is absolutely what the patient needs. We have, uh, it's, it's at least one case a year. There were two cases across all services last year of people who got uh, CPM from hyponatremia being corrected too fast. So this is not a theoretical thing. This is something, and it's an awful experience when it happens. And so I want to really encourage the interns to, to not only know the right thing to do, but actually to go ahead and do the right thing. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So we'll end with the urgent potassium issues. So you've got a new emergency department admission. It's a 45 year old gentleman. He has end stage renal disease, secondary to diabetes. He's presenting with nausea, chest discomfort, shortness of breath. He appears volume overloaded on his exam and he missed his dialysis last week due to issues with scheduling his Medicaid cab. The ED has ordered a STAT EKG and labs. They report that the ECG appears okay and the potassium level is nine. They want to admit him to your team for hyperkalemia. They then have to run to a trauma activation and you weren't able to ask any more questions before you started to take over his care. So we'll do one more breakout for about three minutes. What should you be looking for on an ECG in this patient? And what are your initial steps in management after hearing this potassium level? Um, so we'll do a little bit shorter breakout and then be ready to share your answers when we come back. So we should have everyone back now. Um, Will somebody from, um, let me, I'm just gonna actually pick somebody out of the crowd here. Um, how about, sorry. Can I get the PSL crew? Uh, actually the PSL crew doesn't have any interns. Uh, let's do the cardiology teams. I think you've got some interns on there. Can you guys weigh in on what you'd be looking for on that EKG? either by chat or via your microphone. Do we have our cardiology teams? All right, they're chatting in. 
So they're going to look for peak T waves, a widened QRS, and some flattened P waves. Okay, excellent. And then um, we'll we'll go through each of those. And then we'll um, can I get the UMICU to tell me what your initial thoughts are on uh, hearing this potassium level of what you want to do. You guys not have a mic too? Let's see who has a mic. All right, so the MICU wants to confirm the EKG changes, give some calcium, dextrose, and localma oh, insulin. Okay. Great, good, all good facts. So let's think through this as we finish up here. So here are just a couple of EKGs here to take a look at. Um, so our cardiology team astutely wanted to look for some of these things. So one is this prolonged PR interval. Uh, a prolonged QRS also happens in um, hyperkalemia. And then we'll also see these tall peaked kind of narrow base T waves. So those are kind of some of the key features, especially with a little bit lower levels of potassium. But again, it, you know, people are different. So um, it may not, you, the level of potassium itself isn't always perfect to predict what their EKG is gonna look like. And so here's one that looks a little bit scarier. Um, we don't see any P waves in this one. And we see this pretty prolonged QRS. Um, it's hard to tell the peak T waves because we're getting the, the QRS is becoming even more prolonged in this case. Um, but again, this is another one that's um, for hyperkalemia. And then here's our final one. And um, the cardiology team was astutely said here as well, hopefully not sinusoidal, but <laughs> this one kind of starts to look like that. So we don't have any P waves, super prolonged QRS, and we're worried that they might be going into torsades and we're pretty scared at this point. Um, so this is the one that's super, super emergent. Okay, so as far as management goes, number one, we wanna know, is it real? So if the potassium is nine, uh, do you trust that lab level? If you really think something else is going on, you may wanna recheck it because sometimes you can get um, some hemolysis of the cells and then you, get an inappropriately high potassium. You wanna know what's been done already, so make sure to check with the emergency department to see what they've done, um, because that can really change what you end up doing when you take them over. You wanna know, do they need calcium gluconate? So our MICU team brought up calcium gluconate. Um, that's something to, to stabilize the cardiac membrane, and it doesn't actually change your potassium level, but it'll help them, uh, prevent them from going to an arrhythmia. And that's two um, grams of IV calcium gluconate is what you need to give at, in that, at that point. And then the last one is how will you shift or excrete potassium? So your two options here for shifting or excreting. Um, for shifting, you can give insulin and dextrose. You can do the inhaled albuterol. And again, this is this, higher concentration, um, and you can give sodium bicarbonate, 150 milli equivalents um, of, per a liter of normal saline over an hour. Uh, we'll go through as a chat. Someone had a question. Um, contraindications of calcium gluconate, okay in hypercalcemia. That's a great question. I actually don't know. Does anyone know 100% if, if that is a contraindication? I think in this case, I would, my hunch is to say that you would still give it because that's going to be more important um, to, to keep them from going into a strange arrhythmia. But uh, if anyone else knows the answer with, def with more definity, let me know and, and let the VA wards team know. Um, your excretion options are to give IV Lasix, give a potassium binder, and also to call renal for HD. So these are kind of our approaches. Um, oftentimes, you know, we talk to them, or I talk to the emergency department um, physicians in making this, and they really approach each patient differently. And so I think the most important thing here is to remember what has already been asked, what has already been done, and 
usually they've already contacted the renal team as well. So knowing how quickly someone can get dialyzed is going to change how you approach this. These are your kind of tools in your toolbox that you should remember. And for some people not knowing that there are now um, multiple potassium binders. So our um, UCH MCU team said Lokelma and Lokelma is one that you can use. Um, it works over about an hour, works throughout the entire GI tract. Some of the side effects are edema, um, GI upset and drug interference, and it's pretty expensive. So you're looking at six to $700 for that. Um, Velteza is another one. It works over about seven hours, primarily in the colon. Um, sometimes it can bring your magnesium down, GI upset, um, cause some drug interference, and that one's even more expensive. So about eight to $900. And then the last is k -exalate. Um, And so k is the one that you probably have seen more likely, but it works for over hours to days, works primarily in the colon, and has these side effects like colonic necrosis, hypernatremia, uh, all have drug interference, but it's pretty cheap. And so depending on where you are, there will be a preference. Um, I think just knowing that all three of these exist is uh, the important piece here in case you hear someone say give Velteza and you're like, what is that? Um, so those are the three options that we have for potassium binders at this point. Okay, so we've managed that. I think we're going to skip our other two because we wanted to focus mostly on the things that you guys are most concerned about. Um, and I'm just going to go here to our take home points. If you're really concerned about any of these other ones, I want you guys to let us know um, and we can do them for you. Sorry. And so today I want you to know that hyperkalemia can present as peak T's, prolonged PR, widened QRS. You don't want to sit on it. Um, make sure to assess the, assess the severity of the hyponatremia to determine the urgency and your plan and give free water for hypernatremia. Follow the steps to the acid-base problems and you can do it. Um, try not to get confused by the delta gap, but it will take practice. And as you can see, it's still difficult to do uh, after multiple years of doing it. And then uh, we didn't get to the insulin part, but I think that most of you felt pretty comfortable with that. Um, but if you have questions or wanna go over that later on, let us know and we can do that. Any other last questions before we end our talk today? <laughs> 